Hello, this is David Wallace, and I'm here with PV Reporter at the American Society of Hematology. And we are here with Dr. Michael Grunwald from the Levine Cancer Institute. How are you doing, Dr. Grunwald? Doing great. Thanks for having me, Mr. Wallace. Certainly. Very good to have you. And today we're going to talk about the um, REVEAL study. And essentially what that's about is uh, patient reported symptom burden and peripheral blood count among patients with polycythemia vera. And so this is an analysis from the uh, REVEAL study. So Dr. Grunwald, if you could give us um, kind of an overview and tell me about the 36 month ongoing REVEAL study for our uh, readers. Yes, the, the REVEAL study is an observational trial looking at approximately 2,500 patients. It's actually 2,510 patients enrolled across approximately 200 sites around the, the United States, and that includes both academic and community practices, oncology practices. And we've been looking at various aspects of patient care and, and practices among polycythemia vera patients and, and physicians. And at this ASH today, we're reporting on patient reported outcomes in polycythemia vera. And one of the, one of the goals in care of polycythemia vera is to reduce the blood counts, most importantly, the hematocrit. It's well known that once the hematocrit is reduced, to less than or equal to 45 percent, mm -hmm. that thrombotic risk starts to go down in polycythemia vera, and, and therefore it's standard of care to get the hematocrit less than or equal to 45 in this disease. In this study, we looked at whether controlling the hematocrit and the other blood counts, namely the white blood cell count and the platelet count, correlated with symptom control in polycythemia vera. Okay. And what we found is that in many cases, the symptom burden in polycythemia vera did not come down to the same degree as we would expect when blood counts were controlled. So if, you, if we look at the MPN SAF total symptom score, which is a 10 item summary mm -hmm. of patients' symptoms with polycythemia vera, patients' symptoms did not seem better controlled when the blood counts were controlled compared to when the blood counts were out of control. And that was a little bit of a surprising finding, I thought. Okay. Then we broke down into specific symptoms, mm -hmm. early satiety, we looked at uh, pruritus or itching, mm -hmm. we looked at uh, inactivity, and we looked at uh, fatigue. And looking at these different, different symptoms, for most symptoms, controlling blood counts did not seem to help, to, sorry, controlling blood counts did not seem to help control symptoms okay. with the possible exception of patients with more severe pruritus or itching. Okay. All right. So you bring uh, to mind a couple good points, and I should mention that um, you're my doctor, and um, I'm in a, a good situation um, as far as hematologically. I think my numbers would dictate that I'm in a complete hematological response. Uh, would, would you say that? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yes I would. Okay, and so when I saw the study, I was actually, it was kind of an eye opener for me because I thought maybe I was a little bit unusual. I'm like, why am I still having symptoms? Because I'm looking at my blood counts and I'm like, wow, they look great, you know, but I still have fatigue is the worst of all. You know, and so apparently that's not unusual. Correct, and I think that part of it is the disease itself is still present even when the blood counts are controlled, mm -hmm. and there are other features of the disease aside from blood counts. There's an inflammatory component to this disease, and in addition, there patients patients who are on treatment might have some effects from treatment that make them have symptoms. Okay, okay. And when you mention an inflammatory component, um, is there a specific reading that you guys look at or tell me more about that? 
I don't have a clinical I don't have a clinical test for inflammation in polycythemia vera, but it is a disease where there is increased cell turnover. Patients are producing more cells and have a more active bone marrow, and a lot of times are on treatments to reduce their their blood counts. And so you have this situation of increased cell turnover that um, does not go away even when blood counts are better controlled. Okay, all right. So I know you mentioned fatigue. Uh, you also talked about inactivity. Those are two biggies for me. Uh, one problem that I don't have is uh, early satiety, uh, satiety, say that word for me. Satiety. Satiety, okay. And that essentially means uh, spleen enlargement, correct? Yeah, it's a, it's a correlated for spleen enlargement. So oftentimes patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms who have an enlarged spleen will get full after they eat much, eas much more easily than patients who don't have an enlarged spleen. And we think that has to do with the spleen occupying space in the abdomen and pushing on the stomach. Okay, and so when I saw that, the first question that it brought to mind does that mean that I'm closer um, to MF? Does it mean that my case of PV is worse? Uh, what's the reading on that, or are there other factors that come into play? I think, I think there are other factors that come into play. Not everybody with polycythemia vera has a, an enlarged spleen, and not everybody with polycythemia vera has symptoms to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, a, if, you, if you look across the 10, ten symptom scoring system, some patients will be will score very highly on certain parts of the scale, but then will score a zero on other components of the scale. With myelofibrosis, it's it's very common to have an, an enlarged spleen as well, and actually it's more common to have an enlarged spleen in myelofibrosis than in polycythemia vera. And in the case of myelofibrosis. Um, you know, which is a more extreme case example of a myeloproliferative neoplasm. The not it, even 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 in that disease, not every patient has an enlarged spleen, and so okay. I wouldn't say that not having an enlarged spleen or not having early satiety would be a sign that the disease is um, becoming worse. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that explanation. Um, another thing that kind of brings a question to mind for me. Um, I have a buddy that had a, a very serious type of leukemia, uh, neutropenia, and he was treated and he went into a long-term remission where he literally didn't see his doctor, he didn't take any drugs, and he was good for years until it kind of kicked back in. And then it was, it was very, quite serious. Uh, so when we look at the CHR or the complete hematological remission in uh, NPNs, I don't really see that as a true remission because the symptoms linger and we still have to come back and see you and we're still taking medicine. So how do you feel about that? I think we need better treatments for, for these diseases, both for polycythemia vera, for other NPNs, and for other types of acute and chronic leukemias. We, we need better therapies. I agree that a complete hematologic remission is by no means a cure of the disease. Mm -hmm. I think it's necessary to lower the hematocrit to lower than less than or equal to 45 as part of treatment. I do think that that helps insofar as it reduces the risk of thrombosis, and thrombosis can both be a cause of both morti mortality and morbidity in patients with polycythemia vera. So I think it's a start, but it's certainly not the whole picture. Now, in terms of reducing the white blood cell count and the platelet count, mm -hmm. I, I th there, there are varying schools of thought. Um, most, most experts think that it's a good idea to try to, to reduce both the white count if it's elevated and the platelet count if it's elevated but the hematocrit is, is the one that's the most well established okay. in terms of helping the thrombotic risk. Now, if, you, if all three are controlled, you might still have symptoms and you could still be at risk for progression of disease to either myelofibrosis or to acute myeloid leukemia. So I agree with your statement that it, it's not a, it's not a um, cure even though it is a hematologic remission. Okay. When patients have CHR. Okay, and thank you for clarifying that because I know there's uh, patients that listen and 
uh, ask me and they hear the word remission, they're like, oh, you know, I'm good, and it doesn't quite work that way in NPN, right? Correct, and it's better to be in remission than not be in remission, mm -hmm. but a remission is not equal to a cure. Okay, all right, perfect. And in wrapping up, what I'd like to ask you is, um, so where do you see uh, the study of NPNs progressing in five to ten years? Uh, what's the roadmap? Uh, where do you see things going? I think that, you know, I think that the attention to symptom control and quality of life has added something to research in this area where we can work not only on helping patients prevent catastrophic events, but also help them live better, more productive lives and, and hopefully be, be happier with living with this disease. I think that we need better combination therapies for myeloproliferative neoplasms. I think we need better symptom control in, in this disease. And I think we ultimately would like to have cures for, for these diseases, but we're, we're not, quite, not, not quite there yet in many cases. Okay, all right, very good. Well, that gives us uh, something to look forward to, and from what we've seen uh, so far at ASH, I think there's some uh, advancements on the way, and that's encouraging. Uh, so this is David Wallace, and uh, reporting from ASH in Atlanta 2017 with uh, Dr. Michael Grunwald. Thank you. Thank you very much.